He was going to come a couple weeks ago and got hung up on his roof uh, repairing the roof. So the roof is now repaired, I, ho I trust. Yes. And um, so John's here tonight to talk to you about his, his role in the music world and, and uh, also going to play for you some about and talk to you about New Orleans music. So please welcome John Cleary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. I guess, I guess that's your spot. Yeah. Well, so John and I have known each other for, for quite a while, um, working record dates together. In addition to being a, a great piano player and um, uh, a musician, he's also a great songwriter and arranger. And of course, m many of you know he's Bonnie Raitt's um, musical director. So, uh, John, how long have you been with, with Miss Raitt? Um, I'm not really her musical director. Yeah, I should clear that up from the beginning. <laughs> but, I, but I've been playing with her for about eight years, on and off, I suppose. Um, we've made a couple of records and, and tour fairly consistently. We just finished a tour about three weeks ago that ended up lasting for about a year and eight months. So we've Jeez. been on tour since before Katrina. We just finished about three weeks ago. That's a long time to be carrying yeah. dirty laundry around. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So we're, you must have been all over the world, right? No, mate, mostly in the, in the United States. We went to Europe for a couple of months, but it, we've been going round and round and round the States. Do you, are, do you, are, you, are you writing songs for her, or how does that? Are you writing anything new? She's songs? recorded about four of my songs, right. on the last, two on the last album and uh, two on the album pre previous to that. So you're home for a while? I'm leaving tomorrow, going back out on tour tomorrow morning. With my way? With my band, with the Monster oh. Gentlemen. They're going out to uh, to do a little short tour, like a week up the north, up to the northeast and back again. Oh, tell, tell us about your band. The ba okay, the band is um, comprised of musicians from New Orleans. Um, these are guys mostly from a sort of Baptist church background, so gospel musicians. Um, and we play a variety of music, most of which is songs that I've written myself. But we play some old traditional, some, I say old, I mean re traditional New Orleans rhythm and blues arrangements. So it pays homage to the, the history and the tradition of New Orleans. It's definitely a New Orleans band, but the idea is really to try and avoid all the, the cliche stuff. So there's no songs about Bourbon Street or anything yeah, like that. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've heard that band. Uh, now it's the same personnel you've always had, right? Or we have the, the. We seem to have a shifting seat with the drums, depending on who's available. Drummers are in very high demand. So the drummer we've been using for the last uh, couple of gigs is a young guy called Eddie Christmas. Oh yeah, he's great. And he's a great drummer, but his name's even better. When they told me his name was Eddie Christmas, I said, I don't, I don't even care how he plays. He's got the gig as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Just like introducing the guy. Yeah. I was relieved when he turned out to be a brilliant drummer. But yeah, it's good. So there's a fellow called Cornell Williams, who's the bass player. And the guitar player is a chap called Big D, Derwin Perkins. So do you play keyboards with this group? You, you play guitar as well? Or? Uh, occasionally I play guitar. The guitar player from the band is so phenomenal, I'm scared to get anywhere near yeah. the guitar when he's around, so uh, I do occasionally. Yeah. But um, generally speaking, the uh, combination works well. And if I play, I like to have one instrument, at least in the band, that's capable of playing some nice long sustained notes and yeah, voicing right. certain chords. So the, the, being the keyboard player, I end up sticking on that instrument to do that job. Well, so traveling with your own band must be very different than traveling with Bonnie's. Group, right? It's a world of difference. Yeah. yeah, it's like a difference between a Rolls Royce and an old jalopy. Isn't it? <laughs> really? Well, how you guys well I travel. Well, we travel with Bonnie. We get, you know, with the, this all in the details. I mean, you, you know, you don't have to on stage. I don't have to move anything, lift anything. <laughs> I turn up and I have a keyboard tech, and everything is all plugged in. Everything is already sound checked, and um, it's just simply a matter of turning, sitting down, and playing. Right. Um, when I go on tour with my band from here, on the other hand, we all pile in the back of a little van with all the gear, turn up, drag it all in the club, set it all up, do the soundtrack, pack it all up at the end of the night, get back in the van, drive off. The old fashioned. So it's, yeah, it's <laughs> kind of old school. Well, that's, uh, that's amazing. Now, with, now you're, you're obviously not from around these parts. You want to tell people how you got here? And, uh, I'm from England. I was born in England. And how'd you um, get up here? 
I came here just as an adventure when I was about 17. I left, uh, left school and had enough money to get, I worked on a building site and got enough money to get the plane flight together and thought I'd be here for about two weeks, max. Never and that was 27 years really? ago. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, long time. So yeah, I fell in love with New Orleans from the minute I got here. So I've lived here most of my life at this point now. That's amazing. So everything about your music is influenced by New Orleans. <laughs> well, I played, I started playing when I was a baby. I had a musical family, everybody played. So I started playing early. Um, so I'd already been playing for, you know, 13 years or something by the time I got here. But um, the musicians in my family, a number of them had a, had a love of New Orleans music. So I was lucky enough to hear Professor Longhair Records in England before I came here. So you, know, you had your heroes before you hit the ground, then? Yeah. I mean, that was before CDs. So back in those days, um, it was difficult to get that kind of music in England. And I was lucky I had an uncle that had lived here. Um, it was nutty about music. He loved music. And when he left, I can remember when he packed up and left to come to the States, and he left his, his luggage was a pair of jeans and a box, a suitcase full of all his record. He couldn't bear to leave all his 45s at home. And then when he came back about two or three years later, he had one pair of jeans and about four boxes of records. And he brought <laughs> back all these... Um, Great recording, so I was able to go and stay with him, and he would have the 45s, and all the Clifton Chenier, Snooks Eaglin, Professor Longhair, Clarence Henry, I mean, Jive and Gene and the Chokers, all kinds of obscure 1950s New Orleans rhythm and blues records. And as I say, back then, you couldn't find this stuff in England. I mean, to, if you wanted to buy a Professor Longhair 45, you didn't, couldn't go on eBay. Yeah. You, <laughs> you couldn't go and buy a compilation CD. I mean, I had to get on an airplane and fly to New Orleans and go to Jim Russell's record shop on Magazine Street, and then they were, there they were, sitting in boxes. So did you, were you here when Professor Longhair was alive? Did you he died just before I got here. Oh. I just missed him, unfortunately. But I was very lucky because the bar, I ended up getting a job at a bar room, um, the Maple Leaf, that was my first place I went, yeah. my first night in town, I went straight to the Maple Leaf. And I got a job working there, painting the bar, and at that time, Back then, there was a piano player that played every Tuesday night called James Booker. And James oh, Booker was one of the most um, versatile piano players probably that's ever come out of the city of New Orleans. And it was unremarkable for him to be, it wasn't really a big deal nowadays for New Orleans music aficionados, if you mention James Booker, they sort of go into raptures. But back, back then, it wasn't remarkable. It wasn't really anything particularly special. And he'd go in there any time. He'd always be hanging out at the bar or sitting down just playing the piano in the corner. Wow. So um, that really was the main influence on me. The, that was the, the, the best example of a real New Orleans piano player that I was able to get close to for the well, first couple of years. What about um, Booker did you, did you take away? Did you use some of his approach to the piano? I try to. <laughs> Whether I succeed or not, I don't really know. James Booker, if any of you are familiar with James Booker, had very big hands. And he could reach some intervals that I physically can't, I'm incapable of reaching, and it drives me nuts because I wish I could. But he would use tenths a great deal. So he'd play these lovely blues tunes using these tenths in the left hand. So <laughs> so there's a certain color you get when you're playing the blues, and New Orleans blues 
it was always a little bit more musical. I mean, the blues is a, is a very vague, catch-all kind of phrase. It doesn't really mean anything, really. But as far as the way they play the blues in New Orleans, um, it was specifically as regards the piano. It was often much more eloquent than, the, than the styles you find from other parts of the country. And that was due in large part to what the piano player does in the left hand. So that particular example is to do with a harmonic aspect that, that James Booker was particularly good at. Well, most of the people in the room are a musician in some sense or another. Um, you want to talk about that in more detail? So in what way is it harmonically distinctive? Um, in, as far as New in Orleans music is hand. concerned? In the left hand. Yeah. Um, it's not just a bass part. No, it's not just a bass part. With James Booker, and you look at um, Jelly Roll Morton too, the bass is a very, the left hand is very, very important. I mean, it's important in any kind of piano music. Not necessarily more important in, in New Orleans music, but at least with somebody like James Booker or Mac Rebenack, um, it's the way you voice the chords. You can voice a lot of passing chords. So in the, if a song is a... If you like, if a song is telling a story, if you like, you start on the one chord and you go around a series of chord progressions and end up back in the one chord. This is feeding back a little bit, by the way. Um, it's a matter of how you get from point A to point B, C, D, and all the way back around to the one chord again. And if you're careful about it and, and employ as much taste as possible, you can use all sorts of lovely substitutions and it's like embellishing a story rather than just itemizing the salient points you can actually get from one to the other and in the process you bring the listener along with you it's like taking somebody on a journey so you could for example go from C to E as a passing chord to get to A minor instead of just going from C to A minor so you can do this in several ways there's all kinds of different ways you could simply play an E chord which would be Its most simple form is, is a bit ugly. Or you could do it like this. You could go. It's a subtle difference, but here you're using B minor as a vehicle. And then that whole chord is being voiced in your left hand. So it's a passing tone. So you can play the whole chord progression just with your left hand. So you can do all this stuff in the left hand. Of course, the left hand doesn't necessarily just play by itself. You, uh, everything complements everything else. But if you're careful in the left hand, you can set up a nice bed and tell the story. And then your right hand is free to play solos and embellish and put the icing on the cake. What's, uh, can you play one of Booker's songs for us that you particularly like? Sure, sure. This one's, um, he did all sorts of stuff. I mean, he, one aspect of, of, what he, of what he did was um, was a certain kind of persistent rhythmic fig, and I'll play you something like this one. This one he did called Pup's Dilemma, and I can't play it just like James Book. I wouldn't no. even try to play it like him. So it's just it's just an impression of the of the tune. There are people who can play it just like him, but they never play it quite as well. And it seems a bit of a pointless exercise, really. So this is kind of similar to. What he did. Thank you. 
Thank you. So how does Booker differ from Professor Longhair? Can you, can you show us a little bit of that? Uh, Professor Longhair was, a, uh, they're separated by a generation. Professor Longhair really came up in the 40s and the 50s. And Professor Longhair, um, I'm not a Professor Longhair expert, there are probably people that are, but it, what he did was take something that was fundamentally pretty simple and throw in a rhythmic element that was very unorthodox and unusual, but one that can be recognized in the music of the Caribbean. So he was like a little bit of a missing link between New Orleans and the Caribbean islands back at a time when New Orleans was really more connected to the Caribbean by maritime trade than it perhaps was to a lot of other major American cities, because you have to remember that the I-10 wasn't even built until the 1960s. And before then, the roads out of New Orleans were not good. The port of New Orleans was the biggest port in the country, and there was constant trade. There were boats coming in every day from Nicaragua, uh, and South America bringing up bananas, and Central America bringing up bananas and citrus fruit and then from Haiti, and from Cuba, and from Jamaica. So there was a constant stream of interchange, people coming back and forth between the Caribbean, Caribbean islands and New Orleans. And um, one of his best known tunes is uh, Tipitina. You all know Tipitina is the nightclub on Chapatula Street. Tipitina is a song that a lot of bands do. I play it with my band, a lot of people play this tune. And it really is, derived from a tune that's way older called the Junkers Blues. And the Junkers Blues was pretty much a staple, basic tune that anybody who had a piano in their house could pretty much get their hands around. It was the simplest kind of blues tune you could play, and pretty much anybody that loved music and had a, a bit of a knack for playing music in New Orleans back in the 20s and 30s and 40s could probably sit down and play you a version of the Junkers Blues. And the Junkers Blues was, was like this, similar to this. So that basic form of that blues ended up becoming the, the blueprint for a lot of songs that were big hits out of New Orleans. Whether it's, you know, um... Well, now, lonely, 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 Miss Cloney Bet you shall look good to me Please don't accept me, baby You know it can't be me Fat man, cause I weigh to 300 pounds. All the girls they love me, cause I know my way around. It's exactly the same form. Right. That was a Fats Domino hit in 1949, right. and Lordy Miss Claudia was a hit for Lloyd Price. And then you got you know, Stagger Lee. <laughs> Stagger Lee, sharp in the line. You shot that boy so bad You know the bullet went through Billy And it broke the ball Then it's glass Same form again right. And then you have Tina Now Which was a big hit for Smiley Lewis um. Tina, Tina, Tina Tina, 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 Tina.
music tunes. That's a very old, basic form of New Orleans blues. Now, when Professor Longhair got that, he all of a sudden changed it from this feel. <laughs> shift and when you get to there it's not a big step to go here Caribbean and the music of New Orleans, and Professor Longhair is important because he was one of the best examples of the two existing happily side by side. You can see that in his music. There's a lot of his, I mean, the, the, I, the word rumba comes originally from Spain, and it means, in Spain, it's to do with a way of, a style of flamenco, and rumba in Cuba is, there are three types of rumba in Cuba, which is Afro-Cuban rhythms, sung to a clave, <laughs> and here in New Orleans, when you say play a rumba, everybody understands it's going to be this group here. <laughs> Simple rumbles would simply be just that. And when Professor Longhair played it, he would take that left hand pan and offset a right hand thing and say, really, you've you got to remember that the piano is a percussion instrument. So it's almost as if you were playing conga parts. Huh. Interesting. I'm transferring that to the piano. So it gets funkier. And in New Orleans, as far as the, word, the way we understand what the word funk means, it's, in case anybody's confused about that word, it's to do with syncopation, where you break up four beats of a bar and place emphasis, place the emphasis on the odd beats. So you get the kind of feeling that it's a little bit, it's like driving along in a car with one wheel that's too small. <laughs> you know, you know, you just keep going. <laughs> Olivia and New Orleans, you already know that anyway. <laughs> yeah, they probably do. Yeah. Well, who were some of the other uh, players that were links in the chain? Well, the guy that used to play, the guy that Professor Longhair used to go and see, there was an influence on him who was still alive when I moved here and used to play uh, just up the street at the, at the uh, Collins Hotel every night. There's an old guy called Toots Washington. Um, and by the time I got here, he was already an old man. He couldn't really play as well as he mm. had been able to play when he was a young man. You know, the style that made him famous. But I think the, there was a difference between kind of barrel house piano players who played the same stuff I've just been playing to you, and then an older generation who consider themselves to be um, more accomplished all-round musicians. Um, perhaps the most famous 
piano player from here was Jelly Roll Morton. Jelly Roll Morton is known around the world. Um, he recorded a great deal, and very often you'll hear him playing in the context of an orchestra or a band. And the piano is actually pretty far back in the mix. Mm -hmm. But there are recordings of him just playing solo, and you realize that the syncopation was an advanced science 100 years ago in New Orleans. Uh, where perhaps it wasn't in other parts of the country. You know, they had a heads up. But still, but once again, the, the links between Cuba and New Orleans are very evident. There's a, there's a piece of his, there's a thing he did called The Crave, and it sounds like it could come out of Havana. At that time, in the early part of the 1900s, there was a style of music called, Dan, um, called the Habanera. Mm -hmm. And the Habanera rhythm had come from Cuba and had been taken to Argentina, where it became the tango. Um, and went on to become Danzon, and there still are Danzon orchestras in Cuba. Um, but essentially, if you break it down, it's much more complicated, this, but in a simple form, this the, the revolves around a left hand and a right hand pattern, sounds something like this. Sounds old-fashioned to us, but at the time that came out, that was as controversial as <laughs> as uh, gangster rap is now. Really, I mean, a lot of people thought that was outrageous. We can't possibly do that. It, it was, it's, to us, it, it's hard to believe, but it was wild, sexy, raucous music at the time, and it made a big influence here in New Orleans, especially amongst the Creole musicians. So, one of his pieces, which is kind of like in, in that habanera style, is called the Craves. scaled-down version of it. <laughs> but you can hear, it's kind of important to know about all this stuff because even in that middle section, that you, know, <laughs> you see there's the rumba that Professor right. Longhair played 50 years later. <laughs> and there's also, if you listen to that, that, that rhythm, we said it's called rumba, but here in New Orleans they have another expression for that, they call that paki way. It's that... You'll find that all over the Caribbean, right the way up here to New Orleans. That's about where it stops. But it's important to know that because in the, in the next coming week, you're going to hear this groove. Every time you hear Hey Paki Way, which is a big carnival tune by the meters, you listen to what Zigaboo Model East plays in the front. And you, that rhythm goes back probably 150 years here in New Orleans and in Cuba. So there's a real link, that's the whole point, there's a real link and a linear evolution of this music as the years and decades have rolled past, the styles change ostensibly and the instrumentation changes and the tools with which they make records and, and, and perform live have all changed, but there are some fundamental building blocks that are still here and that's a remarkable thing and it's worth noting because that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the United States, that's just here in New Orleans.
Do you think it's the it's music of history though, or is it music that points to the future in some way? Are, are we endangered here from losing this? I mean, who's carrying on this tradition right now? Well, that particular thing I'm just talking about this that's kind of in the hands of the of the Mardi Gras Indians. Oh well, yeah, that's one cultural organization, okay, it's not really an organization, the minute it becomes a, an organization that's doomed to fail, it's a spontaneous thing that people here just do. And that is one arena in which, thanks to Mardi Gras, a, a, an aspect, a recognizable aspect of uh, previous musical stylings has, has been allowed to, to um, continue to thrive. Um, the minute they stop doing it, it's gone. Yeah. You know, I mean, unfortunately, the rate at which um, music is disseminated now through the media internationally means that a lot of regional styles tend to get discarded by youngsters coming up who want to, to embrace what's hip and what's new. That's natural. Everybody does that. Mm -hmm. But often that means um, that you will embrace something that has nothing to do with your culture here, you know. Um, so in New Orleans is just, New Orleans is a little bit behind. I mean, that's kind of the reason why everyone digs it so much. It's always been a little bit behind. The, it's, it's a, physically, it's a long way from everywhere else. And as a consequence, the culture hasn't, hasn't been completely stamped out yet. I mean, there's a danger that it will be. But... Um, it's ultimately up to the people that live here to keep doing it. Because you can set up societies to preserve this, that, and the other. And the minute you turn something into a museum piece, that's history. It's gone right then. But when you have you know, just the regular poor people in the neighborhoods four or five blocks from here. Uh, what day of the week is it today? Today's Monday. Today's Monday. You could have gone five blocks from this room last night and heard Mardi Gras Indians playing those exact rhythms and singing phonetic songs that have been passed down over a hundred years. Huh. Every Sunday night leading up to Mardi Gras. And there's an area down on, um, i say five blocks, maybe longer than more, a bit further than five blocks. But you just go back, back into the neighborhoods, back to St. Charles. There's all kinds of bar rooms where the Indians practice on Sunday nights. It used to be the H&R bar on 2nd and Dryad Street, and that burnt down. But there's another one around the corner from there. So it's going on, it's alive and well. And as I say, it's a spontaneous thing that the people that live here do. And it's great that there are organizations and people that raise money to help the Indians make their costumes. I mean, it's, you, you, you need to do everything you can to make it possible for the institution to continue. But as I say, it's the fact that it comes from the people themselves is what's important. The minute you try and make it a, a, an academic right. point of interest or a uh, an, uh, a museum item, then it's doomed to, to extinction. Well, tell us about vocal styles. Is, is some vocal, is, who, who influenced you in that respect? What singers did you like, or do you like? Um, all sorts of singers, not necessarily specifically New Orleans singers. Um, I mean, if you're a singer, there are some sort of fundamental things that are important. You've got to, your pitch has to be good. I think the vibrato is important. You have to have any control over the way your voice modulates. <coughs> the same way as a piano player. You have to be able to play a trill with a degree of consistency. Or a, a harmonica player, or a saxophone player, or a guitarist. You have good control of your instrument, and you can play with nice vibrato. So that's important, and then you have to sing from the heart, and it's got to come from the soul. I mean, I think that all the, the, the just all the singers I like, I mean, they're quite varied, but they probably would all would say that their influences come originally from gospel music, hmm. Ameri black American gospel music. We had a great gospel singer here a few weeks ago. So I heard, yeah. yeah. He tore it up. Well, Deja, huh? what about your own songs? Um, what's your most successful song, your most recorded song? Uh, well, it's not as if millions of people have been out recording my song. Yeah, <laughs> so but I don't know, but some very I don't know if I can honestly answer that question. Uh, um, I've written a few songs that have been covered by other people, but it's not that none of them have been big hits or anything like that. What one do you, what do you like? Play the one, one that seems to be most popular on my gigs when we play 
is a song called When You Get Back. And I think probably be it's popular because it's got a catchy little hook. Um, I think also with songwriting, I mean, there's no... There are a lot of inconsistencies in this. I mean, there's no one formula that guarantees a good song or a hit song or an enduring song necessarily. But of course, you're the, uh, you're, there's not musicians here, so you know, you basically you have to have a, a melody that is engaging and has to be supported by a chord progression. And the lyric normally has to say something, although perhaps some of the most successful pop songs have comprised of lyrics that mean absolutely nothing whatsoever. You know, it could just be a chant. Um, but I like good lyrics. Which comes first for you? Um, because of normally, they, I think they, it's almost like they come together. I mean, the good songs, and I've spoken to a few other people who write songs, and they, they all seem to feel the same way. When you feel like you've written a good song, normally it comes to you fairly quickly. Huh. And it's almost... The, the most, well, I can only speak for myself. I feel the songs that I've been most happy with almost come to you completed and it's as if you're just your you're, you're sort of, your antenna goes up and it's a particularly clear day and you get the signal and it's as if somebody else has written it and you're just channeling it that must <laughs> be fine i've heard so that. the so yeah i mean there've been some songs i've been trying to complete for about 15 years and i think they're going to be great songs one day but i still can't finish them and there are other songs that actually it just seem to they just come out already finished you sit there with a pen and a piece of paper and then the form is obvious to you and the lyrical things ideas come really quickly but generally speaking for me I think I find that I'll have a hook and a melody and a chord progression will all come together and I've had most success in writing songs after I've been sitting down playing for, for an hour or so I think you have to play a great deal well, I'd, I'd personally have to play a great deal you just sit there and just doodle around and start with the basic idea and here in this instance I'm playing in G minor and that melody is taking place over a five chord a raised nine making a diminished chord and then resolving to a G minor but then you can if, you, if that's going to be your hook melody you can take that and then do a little twist with it. You can upset the, the cart a little bit by doing something, something like I just did there, which is, I can remember how it, how it goes. And then, so take the same melody and put a different chord over there, but make it a loaded chord, so it's a seventh. So that suggests that it's gonna go right, to resolve there. And then you can play a little trick. Instead of resolving to where you think it's doing, you can go, can throw another element in there that once again needs somewhere else. Okay. listen to Paul McCartney records and I don't really listen to Stevie Wonder records but they both those two are obvious examples of something that I actually really dig in songwriting which is where you introduce there's an element of mathematics and there's an element of logic that can come into a, a good melody and a good chord progression and I think makes for a great pop song and there are simple, there are certain fundamental laws of music you can observe, but that's, I touched on one or two of those things, which is where you set somebody up to expect something and you give it to them. And you get the sense of resolution. And then you upset them. And you go, and you play the same. And then you, you might, he goes, what? That's not what I expected to hear. And then you can play the same trick again. By instead of resolving it, 
I think is going to be resolved in this instance, which is a B flat seventh. established a line where you're dropping down a half step. Continue that to this note. And if you're going to play this note, which in this instance is an F sharp, that could be a D major, the raised note, or it could be an A flat seventh, or it could be an F sharp diminished, or it could be, well, I don't know, it could be an E flat with a raised nine. <laughs> Which sound pretty ugly, but you get the point. You, you establish a pattern, and then you un introduce another element underneath it that's a little bit unsettling. And it's like I said earlier, it's a bit like take, holding somebody by the hand and leading them through the chords of a song. It's like going on a little, telling a little story. <coughs> so those are elements in songwriting that, that, are, that are fun to mess with. Tell us a story, John. Play one of your songs for us. She loved me fine when I was riding from Hong Kong and she dug it even better calling long distance on the phone. Cool and sexy, getting that postcard from Brazil. Oh, but now back here, back home. All she want to give me is the chill, she said. When you get back, we're going to cha-cha all night long. She lied. Put a quarter in the phone. A boy said, Leave a message because there ain't nobody home. I'm here in a hotel, just wondering where she's at. You know, the girl giving me a third degree. That ain't where it's at. Sing, when you get back, we'll go chop chop all night long. But she lied. a song, do you go through the process of copywriting it and all that? Do you have your publishing company? I'm not it? very good at all that stuff, I is must, which right? is a terrible thing to say, I'm, not, I'm setting a bad example. We have some You courses. should. I do actually now, I've got, I, I have somebody else does all takes care of all that stuff for me, but. Um. <laughs> a manager? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And who's your manager? Lee Frank. Oh, yeah. He and Lee manage manages them. the Preservation Hall band, too. He does, yes. He used to manage Tipitinas and then he evacuated to San Francisco um, after Katrina, or before Katrina, and, and ends up staying out there. Do you control your own catalog? Do you, do, do you, or you, have you sold your publishing? How do you do that? No, I own all my publishing. I have a, um, an administration deal where they go and collect <coughs> the royalties that are due. Um, I've been lucky in that I haven't had to really go out and, and hustle my songs. Uh, I perhaps I should have done. But a few people have come to me asking <coughs> to cover songs of mine. 
And because I have my own band and because I make records under my own name, I usually write most of all the material on the albums that I do. And that's a good kind of calling card for some people to know all the songs. And um, that's worked well for me, although um, there's a lot to be said for having somebody that actually actively goes out and promotes your songs for you. Um, but it's kind of hard to get that, to, get to find someone that does that really well. At so, least, anyway. so basically, you record your own songs, other people don't. But you got Maria, I know Maria, Maria Moldau recorded half a dozen of your songs or more. Yeah, to, I mean, people I've played with have dug my songs, and, and to Taj Mahal cut a bunch of my songs, and yeah. Bonnie's done, and then various other people. What song did Bonnie cut that, that of yours? She cut a song called Monkey Business. She did one called Mercenary, Unnecessarily Mercenary. Oh, yeah. Um, and my mind's gone completely blank, and I can't remember. Isn't that terrible? I've got to remember four songs. I can remember two of them. <laughs> How many songs have you got in the catalog, do you think? Um, God, I don't know. Hundreds? I wouldn't say hundreds, maybe 50, 60. In my catalog, in fact, my catalog probably means existing on scraps of paper, <laughs> sort of stuck down the back of a drawer somewhere. <laughs> you know. We could turn you into a real business. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could. What about, are you signed, you're signed to Basin Street? Is that right? I made a, I've just made two records for Basin Street, and I'm deciding now whether to make more records of them or go look elsewhere, or take stock of the way things are developing. The, the, the goalposts have moved a great deal in the recent years with the way music is, not only the way music is recorded, but the way it's distributed and consumed as well. <coughs> And the possibilities for distributing music via websites and via the internet is, is quite interesting. Do you have a website? Yes. Who keeps it up for you, Lee? It's an organization in San Francisco that I sort of maintain it. And through the website, we sell CDs and T-shirts. And no downloads, though. Mm, you can download stuff, too. Yeah. You can download so you can buy some of the album songs directly. So do you, where do you see yourself in five years? Are you going to stay on the road or you want to get off the road? Well, I've been on the road for the last 10 years, pretty much nonstop, with one band or another. So I uh, find the problem of being, I like being on the road, but one problem is that I don't have sufficient time to write right. and, to, and to shed, and you've got to be shedding all the time. Um, so I would, it would be quite nice, it would be a luxury, a nice luxury to actually stop gigging and just stay at home and record. I've got a little Pro Tool studio at home. <coughs> and I'm lucky because I started out as a guitar player, so I can play the, all the parts, and I, I quite enjoy working with the machine. So if I have ideas for songs, I'm a I'm sort of self-contained unit. I mm -hmm. don't need to go out and hire other people to interpret the, the parts. I, can, I've got, I know how the bass part goes, I know how the drums are supposed to go, so I can play the drums if necessary, or I can program the drums sing all the vocal parts. Um, so it's not just a song, it's a whole arrangement. And these days with the recording stuff you can get at home, and in the, in the past I would just, these would be sketches, but nowadays if you take care in recording, and making sure the levels are right and you get a good signal, and then the initial sketch can end up being the finished album. You can make a record, you make a record every couple of years or so? It depends. The last record came out about three years ago. Uh, I would make a record every six months if, I, if I just um, stayed at home and did it. But it's hard to make a record when you're living in a bus. Well, <laughs> if you stayed here, can you make money here? Can you make money playing in music in New Orleans? You'd, I did for years, but it was a slog. I mean, I would go out sometimes and do three, two solo gigs and then play at night. So I'd do two, I would do a four-hour solo gig from 12 to wow. 4, and then I'd do another solo gig from about 5 till 9. Um, and then I would go and play from midnight until about 3 o'clock in the morning with another band. So, I mean, that's like playing for that's playing cool. 11 hours a day. I mean, it's great for your chops. And it's good when you're in your 20s to be able to go in your 30s <laughs> to go and do so. I don't think I'd fancy doing that now. <laughs> I guess not. Mm -hmm. Can you even do that now? Um, it depends. I mean, I don't really do that many solo gigs anymore. In fact, it would be quite nice to do it and find an anonymous 
solo gig playing at the Radisson or somewhere where <laughs> I just actually sit down and just play for four hours because it's great for all your muscles and, and it's great. Uh, the more you, if you play music and you and you learn at a consistent rate, you're basically setting yourself up for a lot more work. The more you play, the more you have to work and the more you have to play. I was, I was trying to describe it to someone who was a non-musician the other day and it's a bit like if you look at a tree, when you start playing, you can get infin infinite hours of enjoyment from just going... <laughs> thing when you first learn how to do it. <laughs> it is. But then when you start stretching out a little bit more and you <laughs> get to do a lot more dexterous stuff, then it just means you have to stay on it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, so dealing with the first two branches of a tree as you're learning, over several years, you've got this enormous great thing with branches and twigs and and it's almost as if you have to suddenly be completely conversant and fluent with everything that's going on at the outside boundaries of your knowledge. And it just sets you up for a great deal of work. So it would be good to go and do some solo piano gigs. I'm not going to, though. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. <laughs> Too much work. Is that right? Too much work, yeah. What are you listening to on your iPod? What, what are you um, thinking about these days? Most of the time, I just listen to reggae. I listen to old reggae. Really? Yeah. There's an era of Jamaican reggae called Rock Steady that was in the early, late, very late 60s and early 70s. <clears throat> and that's usually what I listen to for fun. Because there's a lot of soul, it's simple, um, it's real. I mean, it was everybody in the room cutting together. And it was that seminal period before reggae, before it slowed down a little bit, mm. before reggae came in. So they were listening to in Jamaica. They were listening to uh, American R&B stuff, but it has a very distinctively Jamaican flavour. And I find I listen to a lot of reggae music. Yeah. Do you write any reggae music? Are your songs reggae influenced? They're reggae influences, but I don't often don't like it when people. I mean, it's kind of like a an artificial grafting process. Often when people say, "Let's take this song and do it in a reggae yeah. style." Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit flawed, I think, that thinking sometimes. I have very few examples of songs being played outside of Jamaica by non-Jamaican bands that, that really worked. That's not to say that it's not fun doing it, and I love playing reggae. I think I've, I don't know, I mean, I might, there's, one there's one song I like particularly that I might cut on the next record. It's, I don't know, the, you, reggae is deceptively simple. You listen to good reggae bands, and it doesn't seem like there's a great deal going on, but it's very hard to play that stuff right. And when you see a reggae band playing in Jamaica, man, it's like an incredible, well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. The parts that everybody plays are very, very specific. It's kind of a little bit like playing New Orleans music. You know, if you play New Orleans music and you're not from here and you've not lived here and you don't really understand what makes it up, then you can <coughs> borrow certain of what you see, what you think are fundamental elements, and end up producing something that everybody knows is not really New Orleans music. You know, you have to have a lot of respect, whether it's respect for Cuban music, respect for New Orleans music, anything that comes out of a long tradition. And if you're playing it for fun, then play the hell out of it. But if you're making records and stuff, and it's a, an artistic statement, mm -hmm. then you have to be pretty careful. Right. Let's see if anybody else. Any other questions for John? Yes, ma'am. When you started playing as a kid, did you start with like scales or intervals or was it difficult to learn where to progress, or did you just like? No, I just learned. I was taught by my dad and my I had three uncles that played, and um, <coughs> and they gave me the sort of. First, here's you know, sit down. Here's how you play. This is called D. This is a D chord. I learned to play guitar first of all, and and I started really young, so I, I didn't have much else to think about. So I would just sit and play guitar for hours and hours and hours every day, and um, and I taught myself pretty much beyond that because they were not they were very enthusiastic amateurs. Really, the people, the musicians in my family, they're not virtuosos by any stretch. So they were able to give me some basic pointers to start with. 
And from then, it was really an exercise in logic. Music is, is this beautiful marriage of, of sort of abstract math, uh, mathematics and, and, and a completely abstract thing. It's, t- it's two things which are totally different, welded, married together. Um, and you can apply sort of mathematical logic and pretty much figure out how music works. You know, if the minute when you first figure out that C major, when you put an A in the bottom, it's an A minor seventh. That's essentially the same chord, or to C six. It's no different from an A minor. Then you think, well, if that's the case, then an F must be the same as a D minor, and it is. You think, well, you can do that with any chord. So an F sharp has the same essential elements as an E flat minor. You think, oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> and then you find out that a a C minor is essentially the same thing as an, an F7. Except there's that chord, so that's the, what happens there. And then you can one thing leads to another, and after sort of 30 years later, you're <laughs> sitting in a room playing Tipitina. <laughs> so no, I didn't really. And I did have music lessons when I was a when I went to school, because my mum and dad thought I should learn to read music and you know, I should have some lessons, and I was useless. And I would memorize, he would play something and the music would be on the top and I'd watch his hands and memorize it. Really? And then I would, then I would play it and pretend to be reading the music. Really? And he realized I was messing around when I hadn't turned the page over. It was in the <laughs> next page. And, and so that, that was easy for me. But uh, I think I, because I, I learned to play so young, before I went to, before I started going to school, that uh, my, I, the ideas I was messing with were already quite advanced. So, so when I, like with everybody, the, all the other kids at school, when we started to actually have music lessons, couldn't pay attention, it was too boring. Hmm. Just doing the <laughs> running all the scales and stuff. Yeah. I, was, I felt I'd already done all that. So, um, to my regret, my reading and writing skills are not very good. Even though I think I've actually got a fairly, a cl- as in sometimes I feel like I've got a clear understanding of the way it was all put together. And people who have been taught academically and do end up doing things by rote. I know lots of piano players who can sit there and play a piece of music in front of them, take the music away, and they've got absolutely nothing to say. That's true. You know, and I think, given my druthers, if you had to choose one or the other, I, I like the way I learned to play it. Because right. I think then, you, if you start, if you're lucky enough to start young, then as you grow, you grow up with music in your brain. It, it affects the way your brain develops and the way you look at the world and mm-hmm. the way you do so, all sorts of things. And it's it's like a and it's great fun. I mean, it's an, it's an amazing resource to be able to sit down and just. Things come to you completely unbidden. You can improvise and play music for hours. No one's ever written it down. You play it and you stop. You just walk away from the piano. It's gone. You'll never play that same thing again. It just happened at that moment. And it's a way of translating abstract ideas that come to you spontaneously in such a way as you can generate columns of air that move around in the room that somebody else can listen to. You know. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Music. It's incredible. It's true. Mm. Any other questions for John? Yes, ma'am. Um, what has been, I guess, like the pinnacle of your career thus far? What is, what is your high, highest point? This is it, right? This is it right now. <laughs> you asked me that question. <laughs> uh, there are several, I think. The first time I got to play, I loved Dr. John when I was a little kid in England. I had a, a record that Dr. John played on. And it was the, thre- it was the one, it was the, when I heard this, it blew my mind. I played guitar up until that point. And that's when I realized I wanted to play piano. And it was an introduction to a, a song called Farewell to Storyville. And so that just blew me. I said, when I grow up, I just want to be able to play that. If, I can, if that's all I can do, I'd be happy. And then years later, I actually got to play with him when he came to England. And I got hired to play guitar with him when I was about 19. So I was in his band. And that, for me, was dying and going to heaven. <laughs> and, I just, and, he swatched, and, then he, and then we switched round. And I would play piano and he would play guitar. Huh. So that was pretty incredible. Um, that's the one that sticks in my mind, really. And I'm sure there have been others, too. I mean, I, uh, it happens all the time. I played last weekend. We did a tribute thing to Fats Domino at the House of Blues. And um, there was a spare amp, so I played guitar all night. And when on Fats Domino songs, there's only two guitar parts. You either go...
two guitar players, we took it in turns. I did the changes on one song. <laughs> and I played it all night long. We got to play with Art Neville, Dr. John, Alan Toussaint, Al Johnson, Carl Time. And so, yeah, last, last week that was a pinnacle. That was good. <laughs> well, it must be fun to be friends with um, people you grew up admiring. Um, I'm not really friends. I'm too much in awe of them. Whenever I'm around them, I think really? they think I'm a complete tongue-tied, blithering idiot because I can't think of anything. I feel like I should be saying all these sort of interesting <laughs> things and I, can't <laughs> I just sit there and, and stutter and mutter. And I'm still completely in awe of Dr. John really? and Art Neville. Oh, God, yeah, and I'm, Alan Toussaint. Yeah, I can never think of anything to say to them. <laughs> so I've known them for years, but I'm sure they think I'm some sort of retard that just stands in the corner <laughs> shaking. <laughs> I don't think so, John. <laughs> but do you want to play a song um, to close for us? Maybe I'll just play like a little boogie woogie because that's All like right. one of the basic building blocks. Of it. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you.